Well, good afternoon if you are in New York or Cincinnati or any place where people join in song in choruses. That's everywhere in the world. Greetings. It is Friday. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio. Welcome. This is the place where classical music happens. Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers all around the world. My guest today is Bob Porco, who is director of choruses for the Cincinnati May Festival, which is celebrating this year its 150th anniversary. It is a major classical music institution in the United States, a major social institution, political, economic, ethnic, historic. It says so much about this country and also its relationship to other countries, particularly Germany and Switzerland, but really everywhere, that um, such a festival can exist. So, Bob, you have been director of choruses since 1990. Yes. Talk about that. That's a, a significant portion of the whole history of the festival. Well, it is actually. And I suppose it's a third of its existence, but also more than that, because there was a time in the first 50 or so years of the festival, they only did it uh, every two years. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been here a while. Um, when did it start becoming annual rather than every and other I don't year? know the exact year. I should have my facts straight, but it was an early part of uh, uh, the last century. Mm -hmm. uh, and into this took a few years off, I think, during the war, the wars. Uh, but for a long time, it's been every season. And obviously, it's in May. And people at yeah. Yonwood of course for May Festival, uh, people who don't know say, well, what do you do the rest of the year? Uh, well, <laughs> we also serve the course itself serves as the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra course. Uh, so we sing really the whole year with the Cincinnati Pops, with the Cincinnati Orchestra. Uh, and then the focus is two weekends in May. Uh, it varies usually the last two weekends of May where you could come to Cincinnati and within uh, eight nine days, you would hear four major choral programs, separate ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, might have the Brahms Requiem on one night, come in here, Elijah the next, and all that. Extraordinary. So I've always wondered about this, a lot of things about this festival, but we have to preface for listeners around the world who may not know about Cincinnati, that it is now a middle-sized American city, but 150 years ago, it was one of the largest and most important cities in the country. It's positioned on the Ohio River in the southern part of the state of Ohio. On the other side of the river, over a bridge that is sometimes collapsing, um, is Kentucky. Now, historically, in the American Civil War, Kentucky was part of the North. But politically, culturally, in many other ways, Kentucky has been part of the South. And the Ohio River, which divides Indiana and Ohio from Kentucky, is really sort of a barrier that culturally, socially, politically is important because it represented freedom for African-Americans who were able to get over to the Ohio side. Um, Cincinnati has been an important commercial city for a long time. It made some of its money in butchering of of animals especially uh, pigs but it also has had a very long distinguished history as a cultural capital um as a university capital as a place of education as a city that has a large presence of four populations primarily germans people of german origin or german speaking origin some italians some jews and a significant amount of African-Americans that has made it a crucible for a lot of good music of different types. Um, the city has the second oldest opera company in America, 1920, after the Metropolitan Opera. It has a very old symphony orchestra. But what predates all of those things, by the way, it has one of the oldest baseball teams in America, but what predates all of those things is the May Festival. 
And so therefore it began with different origins. And I, I went way back and Bob, if I say something mistaken, correct me. Okay. Um, that they were what are called the Zenger Festa, the singer festivals in Cincinnati that were part of the 19th century European tradition. They were founded by the Zenger Bunds, the, the organizations for singers, which were created originally in Prussia in 1809. And the first Zenger Bund in the United States was in Philadelphia in 1835. Um, it was the Philadelphia Menner Corps, Men's Chorus in German. Um, 1838, Cincinnati Deutscher Gesenger, Gesengerverein, um, in other words, a singer's organization in, in the German language. 1844, the Cincinnati Deutsche Liedertafel, in other words, for leader singing. And then in 1846, the Cincinnati Gesenge und, whoop, Gesenge und Bundesverein Deutsche Arbeiter, which was the first choral institution that allowed women. It was not all male. And then in 1849, groups from Ohio, Kentucky, Maryland, and Indiana created the Nordamerikanische Sängerbund. In other words, from that part of the area around the Ohio River, basically, they created the Cincinnati-based, because it was the biggest city, organization for singing. Now, while this was happening in this part of the United States, yes, Philadelphia and to a lesser degree, New York City had German populations. Interestingly and historically, the other major area of German migration in the United States was a new state called Texas. And places like Brownfells, Texas, there are all kinds of German communities in Texas, as well as Czech communities in Texas. And they too, in the 1840s, were creating these singer organizations. But they were much more entrenched in, and historically based and better supported financially in the Cincinnati area. So by 1873, the May Festival was begun 150 years ago in Cincinnati. And there were 708 choristers in the very first festival, which is remarkable. How many typically do you have today? Well, we're, this was before. You're absolutely right about everything you've said. The, uh, this was before um, the, the organization had its own chorus. That's where we are now. Uh, usually in a festival, we are, May Festival Chorus is the main performing organization. We will be joined this year, it happens from time to time, with the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus, which I conducted uh, for you know, 19 years or so, to do Mahler 8, Mahler 8 Symphony. Uh, but and we do invite different courses, but the main singing organization is the May Festival course. Once it was formed, I think that that was the case. Um, but yes, you're correct. At all these festivals from, and I've read letters from the people back and forth. Theodore Thomas was one of the first music directors back then. Mm -hmm. um, and just talking about the difficulty of the simple little practical difficulties of getting these courses together, getting the music, uh, getting them rehearsed, and they bring them in at the very end. Uh, oh, it's just, and it was truly, as you could imagine, an event. I mean, this was really uh, a, a city event, uh, a local, I mean, a, a state event. It was, uh, everybody came to the city. It was spectacular. Um, so it's from that heritage that we draw um, still. You know, we have people in the course now who uh, come from far away. I mean, from an hour or so away for a rehearsal and all of that. So it's a fascinating history, I believe, for sure. Does this chorus in any way work with the Cincinnati Opera as its chorus, or is that a different chorus? It's a different chorus. Occasionally. Okay. Uh, we would be invited to do something for doing Aida or something that, uh, or uh, one of the Wagner operas of Meister Singer. Uh, yeah. uh, right. That, but yes, it's a separate, we're all in the same big umbrella right around Music Hall. Um, but they have their own chorus. Do you have any idea why it was May? I could hazard a guess, but maybe you know definitively. No, I don't know. Uh, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do 
with traditions there. Uh, these the, these Zengerfeste, I think, might have been in, in there. Germany. Yeah. There, there's the lyric, the in wunderschönen Monat Mai, in the beautiful, yeah, sure. in the wonderful month of May, because in Germany, which is further north than Cincinnati, there are very long days in Germany, more daylight. The weather tends to be very good. Um, there are the May festivals of romantic pairing and all of that that happens in May. It's a very festive month in general. Very and beautiful. not yeah. as hot as it later gets to be. Yeah. And I would guess for all those reasons. I agree. Um, so you mentioned Theodore Thomas, who was the first music director. Um, are there music directors and choral directors? Is that the same job or are they two separate no, jobs? No, they've always been separate. There's been a director of courses or a choral director and there have been music directors entirely different. The, uh, and by necessity, the, uh, the choral director has almost always been local. I mean, I guess I'm local, I live near Cleveland, but that's still Ohio when I go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, while the music directors often have been uh, national and international figures, mm -hmm. like James Conlon, was the longest serving music director. He was here, I think, 37 years. And he and I worked together for uh, 27 or eight of those years. And he. I want to talk to you later about James. He and I are close friends. So we will get into Jimmy Conlon. Oh, yeah. So he, he yeah. conducts all over the world and then comes and spent uh, yeah. May here. And the idea was that when the music director arrives, the chorus is ready to go. And that would be my job. So when does the cor director of choruses begin preparing the chorus for the May festival? Um, I would say almost from the first week, I mean, to some degree. Now, it depends on what the, uh, what the orchestra, the CSO, has scheduled. This year, we started with uh, Mahler II, with uh, Louis Langre. So that's the, the thing that we did immediately. And then we started to dabble in Mahler 8, which was not to be until May. Um, and then we had That's another a very concert. big dabble. Uh, <laughs> dabble, <laughs> <you> dabble <laughs> Mahler 8. But uh, we began to sing it. Then there was an interruption. We did uh, uh, a, a kind of semi-staged version of Pier Gint, uh, uh, of, of a Greek. Greek. So yeah. it is that. It isn't until, I would say, February that we go full bore in all of the May Festival music uninterrupted. Um, but part of the challenge of this job is juggling all of those things and still be prepared and strive for excellence in all of them. There is so much choral music going across many centuries. Is there a core value system that you want to instill and expect from your choristers? There is. Approaching all the music, or is it really different, whether it's Bach or Britain or whatever? No. It sounds uh, lofty, but I just, the, the word excellence comes up a lot. And I think that's our goal, no matter what it is. And I say to the chorus, whether it's your favorite music or not, doesn't matter. And for all periods, you know, uh, and try to be style, as stylistically uh, true as we can be. Uh, I have core values musically. I mean, they're all the standard things. I suppose I'm most obsessed with text uh, because in almost all cases, the text has come first uh, and the composer said it. And it would be a wonderful thing if you sing in English that no one ever needs a program or if you sing mm -hmm. in German, to the Brahms Requiem, the German speaking people can understand it. So that could be a core value. Uh, no, there are certain core things. Uh, just, but how do you make that happen? Uh, by being a nagging, insisting person on one thing, but it really isn't enough to say better text you have to take into fact that the singing or the chorus, unfortunately, in the last 100 years or so, 50 years, 150 years, is always the furthest thing from the audience with the 
professional orchestra in front. So if you come into our course film and you can understand the word, that's one thing, but you have to build into that, that you are singing with the orchestra from behind the orchestra. So everything needs to be slightly amplified. Uh, I don't mean electronic. And it also has to do with the, uh, how to pronounce words. That is that a three syllable, one syllable word might have three things to take care of. There's an L which has pitch, there's an A vowel, and there's a V which also has pitch. And I talk about this a lot and, and it seems to work. If you take care of all the elements in the actual word and uh, remember that singing is not like speaking or uh, they're, they're different languages and that singing is more like public speaking without a microphone uh, with the kind of, or I also, say like a very effective preacher like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who would just enunciate words so that they had meaning. And just the other night, I mentioned Peter Pierce because uh, Pierce, uh, because I had just heard a snippet or reheard uh, the ending of the uh, uh, the war, uh, the war requiem where what oh, Benjamin he done, Britain, yeah, Benjamin Britain, uh, Fisher D. Scow and Peter Perez were on that recording, and what they do with text is just extraordinary. So, it is an ongoing uh discussion and reminder in all our rehearsals, no matter what the language. Can you give an example of you began to talk about it about a word that may have an L and a V, yeah. and the pitch that they're I, you know, in English, it would be love, but it may be in a different language. Uh, well, Liebe in German, it still has an L. And you yeah. have to, it has, uh, it not only has pitch, it has length. And it has to come before the notes. Liebe. L that sound comes before the actual note written. And the L is on the pitch that you're about to sing. Um, or if you sing the word life, that's also complicated. The L, but then your main vowel is an A. It's American diphthong. So at the end, you have to make time for the E part of that, life. And then the F has time. So I say the simple, seemingly simple, one syllable word has four elements for you to take care of. And that yeah. worked. <laughs> <laughs> um in Italian, I know you're of Italian background. I know of someone else with your surname who's from Calabria. Is your family from Calabria? Oh, absolutely, with my surname, absolutely. Um, They're from Calabria. Yeah, my, dad, my, my dad was, uh, and these days, in these political times, I'm prouder than ever to say that my dad was an illegal. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, there were a whole lot of them. Steubenville, Ohio, which also had a you mentioned Cincinnati, but there were so many ethnic folks in Cincinnati and Steubenville, uh, people from Germany, people from uh, uh, Latvia, uh, Greek folks, and the magnet was the, the steel mills, the Weirton yeah. steel and the Wheeling steel. Those those outfits asked no questions. Do you want to work? You got it. No union for them. But he came over as a stowaway. They uh -huh. usually went from, the, went from Calabria to uh, Argentina, many of them, there's a huge population in Buenos Aires. And somehow they got there legally, but then came as stowaways on some sort of freighter um, and found their way. They all had, the reason they came here was because of the steel mills, they had relatives here. Um, so yeah, and I've been there. And most of those people who lived in what I think was their ramshackle building now, it's almost no, uh, all of them were kind of paisani, as they say, uh, yeah. and came over that way and then worked in a steel mill, most of them. And my dad worked there for 41 years and uh, was determined that I wouldn't and insisted that I go to college. And did you speak Italian or Calabrese at home? It was a polyglot. Uh, yeah. because there's a language between Italian and English which Italian folks made up 
uh, you know, they some call American, it dialetto, dialect, you know, dialetto. dialetto. Yeah, and was, sometimes it were American words with a vowel at the end, you know, yeah. to make it stop. But yes, I spoke a little, but again, they were determined I would speak English. So I didn't, I, they spoke Italian amongst themselves all the time. Right. Um, so, I, I, you know, I know a little bit of Italian. I thought I knew Italian until I took a college course in, the lab, uh, in Italian. And this professor said, what are you talking about? You know, it was so different, as you say, from uh, the official Italian language and yes. from Florence and all that. Well, I'm asking because I'm wondering whether you had to, quote, learn or relearn Italian for your professional life as different from the Italian spoken at home. I did. Absolutely. Yeah. Words so therefore, we were talking before about German and English in terms of where the pitch is. Is that the same in Italian in terms yeah. of the letters, the L? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so except double, double L's would be uh, like in the, uh, the Requiem, Favilla, Illa, Favilla. Favilla. Bella. Bella. Bella, Pizza. And that, pizza. That's the example I always use is the vowel made shorter by the double consonant after. Gemma, really, like a gem. Gemma, yeah. same thing. Yeah. Uh, um, the, sorry. That's okay. I, I'm wondering because, you know, when you're teaching a chorus or even one individual singer or a speaker, there may not be certain constants from language to language to language and from musical epoch to musical epoch. The style may be completely different. I, I You know better than I do, so I'm really wondering about your opinion on that. Um Yes, that is true. Uh, there are certain similarities about singing language that are are the same, uh, but the vowels, you know, the difference really between languages is not often the constant. You know, people think, "Ah, oh, okay, that's easy to do." It's the German uh, closed vowels or the, or the vowels with umlauts. Those are all, and we did for the first time for me Norwegian. Uh, just a few months ago with Pierre Gitt, which was similar to yeah. nothing else almost. Um, so every every language has its own. I find English the most difficult to teach because it's the language that this course speaks. Mm -hmm. So any dialectical things, you know, I sometimes tease the course about using Kentucky Latin, you know, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it has a certain uh, twang to it, all that. <laughs> so, <when you're, laughs> and that's opposed to, you know, a lot of times these days we sing German uh, music that is set to Latin. We sing German Latin, like mm -hmm. the Misa Solemnis uh, of Beethoven. We would say Credo with a closed E because that's the likely yes. one. Uh, Beethoven would have heard had he been able to hear at that time. But yes. the, uh, every language, I mean, there are certain basics about how to really make language understood. And then every language has its own challenges. I, um, Vater, V-A-T-E-R, German. In English, is father. People have no problem yeah. saying father. But if they say Vater, there's a tendency to make that A-E-R Fater or something because it's foreign. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting topic uh, for me, actually. Uh, English, I, I was speaking just earlier today with someone who's from Ecuador, and her English is excellent, but she has trouble, she says, with a double O sound. So, for example, W O U L D W O O D is wood, but F O O D is food, and B O and M O O D is, is mood. Yeah. Yes. And S U E D is sued, and there's no apparently immediate way for her to recognize whether it's an U or an U, and this phenomenon must multiply itself many times across many languages, even with the German, the letter A in German, if there's an umlaut would be different. Um, I once appeared in a play by Thornton Wilder 
in which Thornton Wilder, I'm old enough that Thornton Wilder directed the play. And I was hired for that role because I had enough German that I could play the only German speaking character. And for vier und achtzig Jahren haben unsere Väter auf diesem Kontinent eine neue Nation hervorgebracht. That's a line that I spoke 45 years ago. I still remember it. Four score and seven years ago, our, our forefathers brought upon this nation, um, <laughs> blah, 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 by Abraham Lincoln. And it was the German character reciting Abraham Lincoln. And Thornton Wilder worked and worked and worked with me. I kept saying, Unselem Feiter. And he said, No, it's Feiter. He, he was not satisfied with my letter A. And I, you know, you do not contradict Thornton Wilder. But on the other hand, I was pretty sure it was Unsedem Fater. And at least that's how I learned it. And, you know, we are English speakers primarily, and, and your German undoubtedly is much better than mine. But um, we have to kind of have a consensus about the sounds that we're going to make if we're singing it the way Beethoven or Schumann or Mendelssohn or, or Bach intended. Uh, and I wonder, for example, now that we're saying this, you were talking about Beethoven and his German, would the Leipzig school, so Bach and Mendelssohn and Schumann and Brahms to some degree, have a different sound of their German? They might. There's, yeah. a, you know, just like our southern states have a slightly uh, different Slightly? Uh, <laughs> <just> being, <laughs> well, I was trying to, this is going on uh, national broadcast or something. Yes. So I think, you know, uh, like uh, I mentioned Fischer Disco, who I think is one of the greatest singer of all time. Yep. I thought his, German, his German sometimes is wonderful. It is, uh, is a bit regional. Occasionally you can hear it. Yeah. So, yes. And then if you're going to, I don't know anybody who gets that picky about German, but uh, then you would have to find someone who knows that difference and hire them to come in and tell the chorus. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's an elusive thing. Uh, you should never be able to tell a chorus uh, where a chorus is from. Mm -hmm. And that's whether it's May Festival or New York or whatever singing Brahms or yep. the Leipzig choir singing Messiah. Yes. You should be able to tell the difference. Yes. I mean. Um, so let's get to Jimmy Conlon, who, as I said, I've known almost 40 years. And I met him in the early 80s or maybe around 1980 at the Metropolitan Opera where I was working. He was conducting and in fact one year he conducted Luciano Pavarotti, Shirley Verrett and Tito Gobi and Tosca directed by Tito Gobi and I was brought in because I had been a student of Tito Gobi's so I think that's how I met Jimmy Conlon. Amazing. He is a New Yorker, a fantastic conductor, he's the music director of the Los Angeles Opera, he spent a long time in Cologne, he's conducted a lot at the Met, um, he was at Paris Opera for a long time he has a strong presence in Italy, conducting things like Benjamin Britten in Rome and the Rye Orchestra, the National Orchestra, which is based in Torino. So he's very much the international conductor. He was born in Queens, New York. He studied at Juilliard. And we had a common friend named Richard Horowitz. And Richard Horowitz, Dick Horowitz, was the longest serving member of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, um, more than 60 years. And Dick lived near where Jimmy, little Jimmy Conlon lived in Queens and would drive Jimmy to and from Juilliard while Dick was en route to the Metropolitan Opera. So they formed a very strong bond. And Dick Horowitz, apart from his work as a member of the orchestra in the percussion section, was very famous for making batons. And he made the batons for Carl Berman, and Leonard Bernstein and many of the great conductors and also for James Conlon, to my knowledge. And therefore, Jimmy Conlon had this formation of a very senior musician in the Met Orchestra who really knew the repertory and learned the repertory, not from recordings, but from the scores. That's why I'm pointing this out. 
because although James Conlon is not in any way ancient, and nor am I, nor are you, um, some of us are lucky to be able to link back to much older figures. The fact that I was directed by Thornton Wilder, who was born in the 1890s or maybe 1880s, speaks to the way artistic practice is handed down. And I know the fact that a conductor or a singer who learns from the score first rather than the recording is a very different animal than someone who goes to something electronic. Where did you first meet James Conlon and talk about your working with him? Um, this would have been uh, 89, I guess. Uh, the, the, uh, I got a call. I can't remember the year 88 or 89 from um, Stephen Monder, who was the uh, president of the Cincinnati Symphony. I was in Bloomington teaching at Indiana University School of Music. And uh, I'll make it short. Uh, there was an opening for a music uh, course director with the May Festival Chorus. Did I know anything about it? And I said, no. Uh, are you interested? Uh, Robert Shaw says you're the only guy who can do this or something like that. Tell I, listeners who Robert Shaw was. Robert Shaw was probably the most uh, influential choral figure of the late 19th century, at least of the 20th century, excuse me, in America. Mm -hmm. He uh, started in New York at the Robert Shaw Chorale, was Toscanini's uh, chorus master, then uh, conducted everywhere, became the music director at Atlanta. I mean, and whenever there was a period whenever anybody needed to, uh, looking for a call director, they would call him. In fact, yeah. this is a little bit of a tangent. He was responsible, really, for the three major positions I had. The uh, professor in Indiana University School of Music, the May Festival, and the Cleveland Orchestra. He's the one who got me there. So, said um, Robert says we should talk to you about this job. So. Uh, and James Conlon was the music director of May Festival at that time. So we met. I, I didn't want to do an audition because I didn't like 10 minute um, things. Uh, so they came to see me conduct in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. From then on, uh, I mean, I was hired. And then we kind of worked together for the next, uh, until he left, uh, you know, a number of years ago. I think uh, something like, I don't know, it would be 27 years, something like that. Uh, and covered a vast amount of repertoire. I mean, everything from uh, Bach and Handel to, you know, uh, John Adams. So I learned a lot from James. As, as you just mentioned, he is a brilliant man, very musician, but also uh, so impressed with his intelligence and his facility with languages. Yes. I mean, you know, when he conducted in Paris, he he addressed the uh, orchestra in French and went the same thing in Italian. He goes, it uh, speaks uh, it, uh, Italian there when he goes to Russia. I mean, this facility and his attention to language. You know, he's he does all sorts of music, but um, I suppose it's uh, true to say, uh, maybe not. I was going to say primarily an opera conductor, but maybe not. But he does everything. But there's he does always everything, yeah. great detail to language and how it is pronounced. And I think that is uh, that was a big influence on me, actually. Uh, plus, we talk. You know, he hasn't been here for a few years. He's coming back this May to uh, to conduct. We talk uh, every now and then. Uh, we became fast friends. Uh, because of George Bush, I think, the, se the second one. And that is, we both had a similar feeling about him, <laughs> shall we say, that we became... <laughs> so we spent a lot of time talking about that and not necessarily about music sometimes. Um, my birthday is around now, and I, in May of 1996, I was working in Tokyo. And I had just arrived, and... I was waking up on my birthday morning and I was completely jet lagged and turned on the television in my hotel in Tokyo and found a French channel 
And remember, I had I was jet lagged. It was a different time zone. It was a different everything. And I I was in an alter, alternate universe. And through my blurry eyes on the screen with projected Japanese titles, there was a familiar looking f- face speaking in French. And it was James Conlon on a French music program in Paris that I was watching in Tokyo with Japanese titles in such good French that I thought, well, gee, he looks like Jimmy Conlon, but <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Tokyo. And then I sort of focused, and this was before I could immediately go online and see what that was. And about a month later, I saw him and I said, were you just on TV in Paris? And I explained, and I said, I, I watched you in Japanese. And he said, well, I could have done it in Japanese. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's it is remarkable. It is remarkable. Can I go back to one thing you mentioned about how we yes. learn things? Uh, when I was in Indiana, uh, there was a man on the faculty named Joseph Gingold, who anybody in the string world knows was a master teacher. Just uh, when he passed away, whatever, 20 years ago, maybe now, 20 of his students were concert masters around the world. Wow. And he went uh, and he retired from the Cleveland Orchestra concert master, went to IU. I did a very direct way. I'm the first one I ever did at the university. And a day, a day later, he called me and said some very nice things. But he said, the beginning was too soft. Mm-hmm. He said, Toscanini told me that Verdi had told him when they were playing Otello, uh, I think Toscanini was in Verdi's orchestra, that there's no real pianissimo in Italian music. So huh. I was thrilled. Here we are from, wow. <laughs> where maybe he was being sarcastic. I don't know, because uh, uh, Verdi often writes three P's, five P's. Yeah. Right. But I was just so shaken by the idea that that lineage, Toscanini, or sorry, Verdi and Toscanini played in his orchestra and then Toscanini passed that on to Joe Gingold and Joe Gingold's calling me. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. and I mean, obviously it stuck with me forever. I wouldn't be mentioning it. It was just amazing. I know more than a few people in Italy who studied with people who studied with Puccini. Yes. And there's a direct link just one generation away. And yeah. these people are, are my age, so they're passing it on to other people. There are people who, you know, can date their piano playing or their back to Liszt or their composing back to Beethoven. There's a direct line, and this is not something manufactured. Uh, I noticed in looking up some of the music directors for the May Festival that, and this is a name I never pronounced correctly, Eugène Ize, Izai, Y S A Y E. Yeah, Izai. Izai, who was a very famous violinist, in my knowledge. And one, so much so that you talk about the Eugène Izai school, mm. that you're of that or, or of the Hyphus. There are various violinists in whose line you descend. And I never knew that he conducted at the May Festival for three years in Cincinnati. Yeah. There's a long line of distinguished conductors who have worked here, worked uh, in Cincinnati. I have actually known personally and worked with four of them, Julius Rudell, Leonard Bernstein, James Levine, and James Conlon. And it's a remarkable lineage. Leonard Bernstein only did it for one year in 1973, I imagine because it was the centennial of the festival. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The current music director is Juan Jose Mena, but he goes by, is it Juan Ho or Juan Jo? Juan Ho. Juan Ho. In other words, Juan Jose, but he abbreviates it. Yes. I don't know him, but tell, tell us about him. Uh, he's Spanish, he's Spanish yes. from the northern uh, North, uh, Basque country, as he he's called He's from Vitoria, yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's got a, 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 he was with the BBC, one of the BBC orchestras, conducts obviously a lot in Spain, but also has done lots uh, in America with, uh, as a guest conductor with Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. Uh, 
he studied with Chali Bedakov. I don't know if uh-huh. you know this. Right? Romanian. Uh, uh, the guy who kind of gave up conducting because he couldn't get enough rehearsal time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just couldn't understand how an orchestra could do a concert on the standard four rehearsals. So he, uh, and he always wanted more. Uh, he's a terrific musician, Wanho, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, has just a wonderful stick technique. He's a very passionate uh, person and musician, very expressive. And uh, I learned from him too. Nice thing about this job is I probably learned more than the other people do. Uh, that was uh, also something I said about Indiana University. We had you know, Margaret Harshaw was there at Virginia at Sayani, who just passed away the, uh, two weeks yeah. ago. Um, to be Virginia Ziani being the Romanian, beautiful physically, but also vocally and dramatically, and as a character, opera soprano, who she too, there are many people who could claim the lineage from Virginia Ziani. This doesn't mean you're as good as she was or that you can sing the way she did but that your formation, your cultural formation, your stage deportment is influenced by her views. And she was, uh, I would say, a classic Italian repertory soprano, but also was in the first cast at La Scala of Dialogues of the Carmelites in 1957, sung in Italian. So that was something of a specialty of hers, and I w- was involved in a production with her of that in Austin, Texas, a number of years ago. And it was fascinating to meet her because here you're working with someone who sang in a production that Francis Poulenc was involved in, Francis yeah. Poulenc being the composer. That, I mean, I am just awed by that. And there were a whole string of Margaret Harshaw, you know, it was a, uh, there was a hallway which was kind of diva row, I thought, you know, in, uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> where these very famous singers like, uh, 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 I think it was just about Camilla Williams, was one of the first African-American. Camilla Williams, sure. Uh, her studio was right next there. But being in that environment was just uh, uh, such a wonder for me just to talk to them. Nicole, she was married to Nicola rossi Lemani. Yeah, uh, this, uh, uh, this Ziani was, yeah, yeah, and uh, Ziani sang what uh, Traviata uh, uh, 650 times, yeah, or something like that. yeah. Anyway, uh, this business is a great place to learn if you want to, uh, and, and I've enjoyed that part of it as much as anything. Just, um, how do you cast chorus members? Oh. Well, ours is a volunteer chorus, primarily. Okay. Um, so it's, you just come in, sign up for an audition. You come in, I talk to you a while, get a little feeling for who you are, and then have them sing. Uh, I used to do very elaborate auditions, which I don't anymore. Uh, but I have them sing, might have to do a little sight reading, do some stuff to determine their uh, range. but. Uh, Assuming they have a good instrument and are willing, it's. Uh, I, I also want to make sure they're aware of the commitment that this will involve. These singers do something like 60 to 70 services a season. Mm-hmm. A service being anytime they're called to the hall, usually three hours of a performance. Now, when you say 60, uh, 180 hours or something, that's more than four uh four 40 hour weeks yeah plus the we have a system where i expect them to have uh, the first rehearsal at home as i call it mm-hmm. uh, and we provide since volunteer course we provide everything that they might need if we're doing the german requiem then there is some expert speaking german for everything uh if you're singing the bass part fred or tenor then you can listen to the bass part online, all the tools that might be needed. Um, And that's about all there is to the audition, to get uh, a sense of who the person might be in a very short time, Um, and then to hear them sing. And you can usually tell by the first two measures. 
you know, if you want these people. Uh, so that it's open to absolutely everybody uh, to audition. Um, and it's a little bit inspirational, more than that, to think uh, that these people give so many hours a week or a, a year for the love of music. Yeah. Strictly for the love of music. In May, there are 16 services in two weeks. 16 huh. services in two weeks. People take their vacation days during that time if, if they're busy or they go to work and get something to eat and come directly to rehearsal, get home at 11 o'clock. Hmm. That's, uh, and we get it done. And it's a real charge for me. I mean, uh, we work very hard. I'm not always easy, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find that people love to be challenged. Yeah. And if you set high goals, uh, high expectations, for the most part, people will rise to that singers will rise to that again unless you're unreal about what you expect uh so it's rewarding it's hard work and rewarding and we go out have there. you ever sung in a chorus just in college in a male chorus that's all okay was, i'll tell you why i'm asking i know more than a few people whether they're professional singers or the other day i ran into an 87 year old neighbor of mine who was rushing out on a saturday morning to go to his chorus rehearsal and he's a professor at the new school <clears throat> in the sciences and i did not know that he sang so many people tell me that there's a particular emotional gratification that comes that in joining your voice with others i hear that all uh, the time could you describe that well uh, you know that First of all, back up, I'll back up just a minute. The room is filled with people who basically don't know each other. I'm sure completely diverse and sometimes very opposite ends of the political spectrum, the religious spectrum, the age spectrum. I mean, we don't have an age limit, but we have people like 18 years old and people who are have been in the chorus 35, 40, 45 years. Yeah. The one thing <laughs> that brings them together on Tuesday night is the music. Mm -hmm. And while these people aren't, don't feel comfortable, maybe to standing in front of, in front of a group of people and singing a solo, although I, I say you should sing like a soloist, yep. is a communal thing, uh, a communal thing of singing together and that I think is unmatched. It's hard to duplicate and unequal. You know, I can't speak for a bowling team or something, but yeah. you know, because uh, I hear this over and over. And then there's another intangible. If you have a course like ours, that Tuesday night is a special event in your life, completely different. From any, you know, it's if, if you have four kids, it's a night away. Or if you're in some sort of grief, if you've lost a relationship or your uh, one of your parents, these are all things that are kind of put away. And here we're going to listen to me babble about music and we're going to sing these notes. It is, I use the word inspirational, but it probably is inspirational to them. Yeah. And for that reason, I, Part of the reason I think uh, rehearsals should be uh, not choreographed with planned. I always try to end the very last thing we sing at rehearsal, something that sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. Never on something that, you know, we haven't learned yet. Because I love to see the feeling and the faces as these people leave the hall. Yeah. So what your neighbor is feeling is exactly true. It... I wouldn't say it's religious, but I, I would imagine that if you're a very religious person and go to church amongst groups, there's a great feeling there. I'm not comparing the two, except that's from the psychological, uh, emotional feeling of belonging. Now, speaking of religion, and I'm not going to do it too much, I always point out to our listeners the works 
and sometimes the musicians selected by my guest. And you have Verdi's Otello conducted by Toscanini, Britain's War Requiem conducted by Britain and, and with Peter Paris and Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and Galina Vishnevsky, if I remember, Bach's Mass in B minor and Brahms's German Requiem. So I would say that we have an opera, Otello. We have the War Requiem, which is on one level of religiosity, very different from Bach's Mass in B minor, which yeah. is different again from Brahms's Requiem, all of which gather within their definition, religion or belief or faith. Um, I would say that a couple of these question are more questioning, whereas perhaps Bach's Mass in B minor is more accepting of the gospel as handed down. Um, Brahms' German Requiem is in German and is a very different, it's a magnificent work, phenomenon because it's in the vernacular. And Britain's War Requiem, just by its name, is about the Requiem for the Dead of World War II, whether they were Germans or British or Russian in the case of that work. Um, so I'm just passing this along. When you, as the chorus direct, director of choruses for the May Festival, are leading a work that has a religious foundation, and perhaps you have people from different religions or who are not believers, um, all performing together, how do you approach the subject matter rather than the music of the work that's in front of you? Um, I'm very careful. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, due to the nature of courses, a large, vast majority of the choral works that we perform that are wherever written were religious, religious uh, based from the Renaissance, whatever right, Bach. Um, so I don't, I don't ever say you should sound, well, I'll back up. I don't talk about the religion. I talk about the mass if we're doing a mass and what it is and where it's, um, Uh, and, and, and how the text evolved, those kind of things. Then I use mostly musical things. Uh, I'll use the word, it uh, should be fervent. If I'm doing Handel, for example, something from the Old Testament, oh, you should be religious fanatics. I put it in as though, I never say you should feel like you believe when you sing Credo. I just avoid that. I would yep. say stuff, pretend like, but then I'll put it in musical words. I'll never, almost never use anything that would imply to them that I believe this, because we have some Jewish people in the course. Um, so I, I try to be uh, 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 neutral about anything like that, just like politics. Yeah. I will say in the war requiem, you know, I talk about the religious text juxtaposed, juxtaposed with what would be considered anti-war sentiment in the poems of Fort Owen and Brahms, I might say, these are, uh, uh, these are all texts that Brahms chose. Does it mention Christ once? Mm -hmm. It's more universal. So I talk about the grand scale and the general area but I try to stay about religion as a topic. I try to stay away that, from that entirely. When I tell people about our country, especially when they're not from our country, and I try to explain this question of the relationship of church and state, um, I always go back to the founders, especially a letter that George Washington wrote in 1790 that says in effect that the church, the state is not cognizant of religion. And I love that word. It doesn't mean for or against. It means that in the foundation, the administration of our laws, a particular religious belief of any religion is not applied. If your personal code is informed by one religion or another or not, um, 
in a pluralistic society, we can bring that to our our national table. Speaking of national table, I <laughs> see behind you. <laughs> how's that for a transition? I see behind you a photograph of you in an apron with something delicious that you are revealing. What is that? And that do you some, uh, that's a, a chicken with marsala, I think. Um, I have um, few, very few interests in life. M music occupies my life entirely. But food is one of them, and cooking uh, is one of them. Now, I'm not gourmet, you are. I have uh, uh, right over here the book, uh, what is it? Uh, it, uh, traveling Italy as a gourmet or gourmet? What's Italy it for the gourmet traveler? Yeah, I have it over yeah. there. That's uh, one of my old books. Yeah, and and this was taken. I I sometimes I have uh, when I was in the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus, they would auction off a dinner to fundraise at my house, and I would feed them. That's when this was taken. Uh, I love to cook. I have kind of a really big restaurant type kitchen, although some of the best restaurants have the tiniest kitchen. Mine's yes. very big. <laughs> Mine's very big. Uh, most of the Italian food. Um, as a side note, uh, during COVID, we had 19 months off from the course. Yeah. So we had Zoom calls every couple of weeks to talk. And then someone suggested, why don't you send us recipes? Mm -hmm. So about every 10 days or so, I sent them a recipe and I made it a big deal for myself because I was so bored. Um, I, made, I did the recipe to make sure because usually I don't measure stuff. So yes. measured everything. Then I took pictures, sent them. So they now have, those ongoing members have a collection of 15 to 20 recipes by Bob that I sent. And I so, also would say something about my mom or um, I'd find this on these little uh, pitiched or uh, these, these little zucchini patties on the stove when I got back from school. Uh, yeah. uh, with a plate over the pilot light, you know, I mean, to keep yep. more. so it is a passion of mine, but not, I don't know, every, I don't know what gourmet means, but uh, if I go to Italy, I don't go to Michelin restaurants very much. I just Nor like, do I. I just yeah. love to go where I can see mom in the kitchen, particularly. That's always a good sign for me. Uh, or someplace where the menu is not in three languages that I go in there. <laughs> Correct. Um, now, those those zucchini patties, <laughs> um, I love those. I don't make them at home. Do you make them? I do. And you can do it with cheese. Uh, and I did the silliest thing. Not silly. It was fun. We have here something called the Cincinnati Pops. It's very popular in the community. Yeah. And... Uh, Conductor John Morris also called me and said, what can we do that you can cook during the program? It was outdoors. I said, I can do some of these zucchinis. Uh, so I put on the chef's hat. They played uh, uh, Mendelssohn, the Italian symphony. Yeah. <laughs> and within that movement, I did the batter, cut the thing, you know, uh -huh. had them all done. And when it finished, I went out and served them to the audience. It was a lot of fun, actually. But my mother would make those often. Uh, and they would often be sitting on a plate on the stove, maybe with a paper towel over it. On the skin, and I'd get home from school at 3.30. And they were fa fantastic. Simple. So I, mean, I, have, I have a proposal for you. Yeah. Because it's the 150th anniversary of the May Festival. Because you nourish your musicians, your choristers, not just with your musical knowledge, but gastronomically, they should produce a small cookbook that will be sort of a centennial or, or a celebratory book that should be sold to raise money um, with your recipes, and I will write the forward. Okay. Oh, that would All be right? fantastic. That would be fantastic. I will do that. I believe in that, but only if you answer one last question for me, yeah. please, Bob. <laughs> You're the second most famous citizen of Steubenville, Ohio, the most famous one being Dean Martin, the entertainer. That's correct. And Dean Martin was of Italian origin, I believe, from Abruzzo rather than Calabria. And Dino Crocetti. And Crocetti. Crocetti. That was his name. But I'm saying, no, I know, but I'm saying his family was from Abruzzo. Abruzzo. Not yeah. Calabria. And I 
had a chance to speak to one of his daughters about his eating practices, not his drinking practices. His <laughs> we know about that, right? <laughs> Jackie Gleason once said about Dean Martin that you and I have been on more floors than Johnson Wax. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, now you, you need to tell people who Jackie Gleason was, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you. But Jackie was. Gleason was a comic genius. He was from Brooklyn. He was born in 1916. They lived next door to a family named Coppola, as in Francis Ford Coppola and the conductor Anton Coppola. He was a comic actor. He was a composer. He was a musician. He was everything. He was yeah. a modern Very Falstaff in a way. He was fantastic. Right. I agree. But anyway, um, Jackie Gleason and Dean Martin. Dean Martin had a reputation for drinking, which was to some degree exaggerated, but he was very much the family man. And they would gather for food, and he loved his mother's Italian American cooking, as produced in Steubenville, Ohio. And Dean Martin's daughter said that the grandmothers, the mothers, uh, pasta fagioli, pasta and bean soup, had a secret ingredient that was only revealed after she died. It was only revealed to a couple of people, and I'm now here to pass it along. Do you know what that was for a pasta and bean soup that Dean Martin loved? It was his favorite thing, and when he was despondent, they would make that for Dean Martin, and they would lift his spirits. Yeah, it's a wonderful stuff, wonderful. Uh, a little red wine, maybe? But I doubt it. Nope. It's a spice. Oh, I don't know. Cinnamon. Oh. So ever since I learned that, I make my pasta fagioli and I add a little bit of cinnamon and it is magnificent. Pretty like bolognese. Well, not really, because bolognese, which would have actually nutmeg more yeah. than cinnamon. Yes, you're but, right. Uh, but Cinnamon with the pasta and, and the white beans, usually white beans, sometimes red, um, is such a wonderful warming sensation in the food without tasting like cinnamon. is just a pinch combined with a little bit of sweet onion and a little bit of olive oil. And the result is just something astonishing. And it's by far the best pasta fagioli soup that I, will, I know. I will try so that. You, Maybe we should have you that. You want to try that? And then put that in your cookbook that you'll publish for the for the May Festival. <laughs> Even if it comes out after the festival, that will be fine. So, okay. Bob Corco, I thank you for this wonderful visit. Um, I do not have in front of me the website for the May Festival. Do you happen May to know? Mayfestival.com, I think. Mayfestival.com in Cincinnati, Ohio, in May of 2023. Yeah. In fact, and it's coming up. Come. Yeah, coming any day up. now. Any any day day now. Now. Lots of great music. I'm, I'm going to do my ad very short. You know, if you come to everything, you get to hear the Bob Mondifu got you hear three new commission piece, one by uh, James McMillan, you hear Mahler 8, you know, uh, you can see uh, Marin Alsop conducting, do an interesting Wonderful. piece by uh, African American, early African American, Nathaniel Dett, The Ordering mm -hmm. of Moses, all that stuff. In our beautiful Fantastic. historical music hall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just did my commercial. That's that's fine. I thank you, and I look forward one day to meeting you in person, and, I and hope maybe so. we'll, we'll cook together as well as make music. That'd be fine. I'd love to talk to you. You're a very interesting man. Likewise, thank you. Grazie. Bye bye. Danke. <laughs> Prego.